rätten. En grundprincip i en rättsstat måste rimligtvis vara att alla brott som kommer till myndigheternas kännedom så långt som möjligt faktiskt utreds. Det andra kravet i livet det handlar om att kommunerna måste kliva fram och ta sitt ansvar för de som har drabbats av brott. Vi vet att kommunerna sedan länge har ett ansvar för alla som vistas i kommunen. Man har fått ett betydligt ansvar för de som drabbas av brott, men fortfarande så är det stora skillnader hur Sveriges 290 kommuner hanterar det här. Och det tredje kravet som vi driver det handlar om att det måste råda nolltolerans för våld och hot i skolan. Nu vet att vi har länge kallat det för mobbning. Och om ni vill ha igång oss och provocera oss så kan ni prata om mobbning. För vi pratar inte om mobbning, vi pratar våld och hot, sexuella trakasserier och så vidare. Eftersom det sällan är en jämnbördig konflikt som det här med mobbning implicerar. Utan det handlar många gånger om brottsliga handlingar som skyms under det här flummiga begreppet mobbning som egentligen ingen kan definiera. Eh, idag så ska vi fokusera på ett av de här kraven. Under andra seminarier som vi har under veckan, ni har ju alla fått ett program framför er där vi redovisar några av de elva seminarier som vi kommer ge här under veckan där vi kommer belysa frågor om kommunernas ansvar för brottsdrabbade, vi kommer titta på frågor om hur brott i skolan hanteras idag så fokuserar vi på det första kravet, nämligen att alla brott ska utredas. Jag ska säga några ord till, men innan det så lämnar jag över till min, min kollega här på IF. Ja, eftersom vi inte är så väldigt kända så kan jag hålla mig lite kortare, Magnus. Men jag heter Caroline Oliana, jag är informationschef på IF. Och, vi på IF har drivit den här frågan, eh, engagerat oss i frågan om vardagsbrottslighet under flera år. Därför att vi tycker att utvecklingen går åt fel håll. Eh, det är en trend som behöver brytas. Det behöver begås färre brott och det behöver, fler brott behöver lösas. Eh, och vi tycker att folk måste få tillbaka tilltron för polisen i större utsträckning än, än idag. Så därför så hoppas jag att det här seminariet kan bidra till att inspirera lite i det fortsatta arbetet mot vardagsbrottslighet i Sverige. Mm. Nu går jag sätta mig. Mm. Upplägget så att alla är medvetna om det, det är ju att vi har en och en halv timme. Jag kommer säga en ord inledningsvis. Därefter så kommer jag lämna över till dagens moderator Hazar och som ni förstås känner igen. Sen kommer vi ha två experter här från New York som kommer beskriva lite av det man har gjort i New York. För ni vet att den utveckling vi har haft i Sverige har ju varit på det sättet att de anmälda brotten har ökat med ungefär 20 procent under de gångna 20 åren. Om vi tittar på brottsutvecklingen i New York däremot så har ju faktiskt den anmälda brottsligheten minskat med 80 procent. Och rimligtvis så borde ju olika aktörer då i Sverige ställa sig frågan Nej men vad är det då man har gjort i New York för att minska brottsligheten med 80 procent? Och vi menar att alldeles för få personer i Sverige ställer sig den frågan. Och när man mot förmodan ställer sig den frågan så handlar svaren oftast om nolltolerans. Ni känner igen va? Fler poliser, hårdare tag, fler i fängelse. Men är det så enkelt här? Är det på det sättet att nedgången i New York med 80 procent när det gäller anmälda brott under de gångna 20 åren beror på att det är fler poliser eller att man har nolltolerans eller att det är hårdare tag? Ja, för att svara på den frågan och få lite mer kött på benen så har vi tagit hit då två experter. Dels Joseph Nadjen som har jobbat på NYPD, alltså New York-polisen i drygt 20 år. Och också Cynthia Nikitin som jobbar på en mycket intressant organisation som jag tycker att ni ska kolla upp sen som heter PPS, Project for Public Spaces, som utvecklar den offentliga miljön. Men innan ni får höra på dem så några få ord om strukturen som sagt. Ni hör experterna, de kommer ha en kort dragning var, ungefär 15-20 minuter och sen blir det en avslutande paneldebatt där också publiken har möjlighet att ställa frågor. Och, och, och eftersom vi har en sån ung publik här idag så utgår vi från att alla twittrar, hörrni. Mm. Det gör väl alla på Almedalen. 
Det går ju fortfarande med den gamla heliga metoden att räcka upp handen så här. Men är man lite blyg så kan man twittra. Och då har vi en hashtag för er som inte twittrar i det grekiska, jag vet. Men som heter hashtag NY, New York, på annars. Vi heter att tryggare Sverige på Twitter. Min kollega Thomas Alskog som är här någonstans. Där. Han kommer moderera Twitteret. Han svarar och modererar debatten och diskussionen här. Och sen kan ni också då följa IF på ett vardagsbrott. Okej okay, hörni, som sagt, fokus. Brottsligheten har minskat i New York. Den har ökat i Sverige när vi tittar på anmälda brottsligheten. Vad beror det på? Och varför är det på det sättet hörni? Att så många i Sverige har en uppfattning om att vi har den brottslighet vi har. Och vi kan inte göra så mycket åt det. Det är någonting som bekymrar oss. Alldeles för många människor har en uppfattning att brottsligheten är konstant och att vi inte kan göra någonting åt det. Och en sak kan jag säga, inget är mer fel. Okej, okay, alltså, varsågod. Tack så mycket. Tack för att komma hit till vad vi hoppas ska bli ett intressant seminarium. Första gången jag var i New York var 1984. Jag och min kompis eh, åkte dit och bodde hos några vänners vänner första kvällen. Så tog de fram en karta i New York och så berättade de för oss vad man absolut inte kunde gå, Harlem, Bronx. Vad man kunde gå på dagtid, Brooklyn, <coughs> några delar i eh, på västra sidan. Och eh, första kvällen gick ut så hamnade vi på Times Square som var något av ett snöpp porr och sex och knark till håll. Såg även vi från lilla Sverige. Senast jag var i New York var ett år sedan, då promenerade vi genom hela Harlem och gick på en gudstjänst och promenerade tillbaka igen. Det skulle ha varit helt otänkbart 1984. Och det är om den här utvecklingen vi ska prata om nu idag. Hur är det möjligt att man kunde minska brottsligheten med 80% i New York medan den i Sverige bara ökar hela tiden? Vi har två prominenta gäster som har varit med i det här förändringsarbetet. Den första var med som polis från början, såg hela utvecklingen och jobbar numera som sambandsofficer för NYPD, alltså New York-polisen, Joseph Nugent. Välkommen. Good afternoon. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak. Can everybody hear me? Yes. It's a beautiful country here. I've never been to Sweden before, but uh, very, very beautiful country. And every, most people speak very good English, so uh, that makes my life a little bit easier. Like the uh, my introduction, I didn't understand what he said. It was in Swedish, obviously, but I'm retired from the NYPD, and I now work for MTA, New York City Transit. We run the subway system for New York City. Just to give you a little background on the subway system, the subway system is rather large, largest in the country. We move about five million people a day. Uh, a lot of trains, 468 stations. It's, uh, it's a very large system. And the, the crime strategies that were started back in the, in the 90s in New York City. They were implemented first in the subway because the subway was a smaller, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A, a smaller venue, so to speak, to try it out first, see if it worked, and if it worked, then take it, take it citywide, take it upstairs to the street, the concepts that were implemented. That's what it used to look like. Back when I started as a police officer in 1985, that you couldn't find one inch of clean, uh, if you wanted to write more graffiti, you couldn't find a place to put any more. It was, it, was, it was completely covered. That's what it looks like today. It didn't happen overnight. Uh, the saying that some people use is to get it from there to now. It's like taking an aircraft carrier and trying to turn it around inside of a bathtub. Very, very difficult. It doesn't happen quickly either. But what this, these pictures on the left show, it showed that no one was in control. So even if you got on the subway and you were not the victim of a crime, 
if you rode the subway from home to work, work to home, and that day you were lucky enough not to be the victim of a crime, you still felt unsafe. It's the perception. It's how it feels. It doesn't feel safe. You're enclosed, you're underground. It's, uh, it's not a good feeling, as opposed to today. That's what it looks like now. When, when we fight crime, I, I have to throw this in here, when you fight crime, at the same time, the same concepts that are used, you're fighting terrorism. And in today's day and age, uh, terrorism is here to stay, it's everywhere. I hope it never comes to your shores. I heard there were some incidents years ago, but when, when the police come together and uh, when you, uh, a criminal is a criminal, whether they steal something, they steal your phone, or they want to blow up, blow up themselves and kill people, it's, it's, still, it's still a criminal. So we have some hotlines set up. The, the talk of the town, the talk of Broadway, if you ever go to New York City, everybody goes to Times Square. And people saw something, people said something, and it's, it's been a success. One of the major tools that were implemented in the 90s was called ComStat. ComStat is, has now been adopted by other law enforcement, not just in New York City and the United States, internationally, as well as Fortune 500 companies have taken the concepts that ComStat has started. Started by one transit lieutenant, it was his idea, it was his brain, it was his baby, and taken this concept and expanded on it, and now it's used in, in businesses as well. What the, the premise of Comstat, maybe some of you have heard the term before or not, Comstat is all about accountability. Comstat is all about everyone is in the game, so to speak. Fighting crime is not a game, but everyone is in, in the game. And it's accountability. And the crime that's, if a crime takes place, the, the commanding officer, the commissioner, they should know about it. One thing that is, I'm finding out that might be a little bit different here than, than New York, is the mayor appoints the police commissioner. So if the mayor wants to become the mayor again, if the mayor wants to remain the mayor, crime has to be, they have to be handcuffed together. They have to be in step together. They have to be aligned. Otherwise the mayor will be out in the next election. The, the public will, will not tolerate it. No one wants to go back to that picture I showed you before about the graffiti on, on the train. This is a brief breakdown of the NYPD organization and where I concentrate on where I used to work and still in my, I, after retiring from the police department, I now work for the MTA and I deal with the chief in the middle, the transit chief, every day. We're constantly communicating and cooperating and sharing information. You can't do it alone. You can't do it alone. You have to do it in, in, uh, in collaboration. That's a little bit further of a breakdown of an organizational chart, just to show you Manhattan, Brooklyn, Bronx, Queens, and everybody is accountable. Everybody is accountable. Back to Comstat. There are 2,500 police officers assigned to the subway. Some people think that the answer to New York's success is more police. More police, more police, more police. That's not the answer. It's smarter policing. Right now, uh, there are less police officers today than were in 1995. In 1995, there were three separate police departments and they merged the three police departments. One was in the subway, one was in the housing, police, which was public housing, and the, the other one was the NYPD, which patrolled the streets. Mayor Giuliani at the time, he merged the three police departments. Almost at that time, about 40,000. That's a lot. That's bigger than some country's army. However, right now between uh, the economy and layoff, not layoffs, I'm sorry, retirements, they don't uh, they haven't been replacing them as much, the money is not there, so right now they are doing more with less. That's just an example of what's assigned to the subway. 
The next slide I'm going to show you, I'm going to leave it up for a while because I want you to see it and I want, I want it to sink in. I want it to sink in. Look at those numbers. This is just in the subway. In 1990, 26 people were killed that year in the subway. Last year, two. Rape, 33. 2012, 10. Robbery, which is a very common crime. 9,000 plus. Last year, 787. Assaults, 1,300. Last year, 200. Burglaries, 174, 27. You could kind of read it for yourself. However, if you look at the bottom, the, the three quarters of the way down, total major, there were 17,000 major crimes in the subway in 1990. By major, we have seven major felonies. Not minor, petty crimes, these are all major crimes. Last year, 2,700. If you were a commuter, if you were riding the train every day, if you were going back and forth to work, to home, get your children, your children go back and forth to school, you're concerned with average per day, average per week. So do the math. Five and a half million people a day ride the subway. 7.4 people are the victim of a serious crime. I think you have a better chance of hitting the lottery than you do to, have to become the victim of a crime. I'm proud of that. I was part of that change from starting in 1985 and 1995, the merge, and I retired in 2005. So I did 10 years prior to the police forces being merged and then 10 years after to see the difference, to see the changes that were implemented. They then took those concepts, because you can't change everything overnight, they took those concepts and they expanded them citywide. So I think that, that speaks volumes. I think that speaks volumes. It's not an accident. It's not an accident. There are some special specialty units. Uh, I'm just going to show you some pictures rather quickly, some sexy stuff, as people call it in, in law enforcement. Canines. Some photos of graffiti. I see some here. You have it as well. So no one is immune. That's, those are recent, so they do still happen, but nowhere like, like before. Homeless, I've seen some homeless here. Uh, one thing I'm surprised about, it appears that, and I'm not saying anything negative towards the police, but in New York City, a police officer will not walk by a homeless person and do absolutely nothing. I don't, know what, I don't know what the arrangement is here. I don't know if the police engage. I don't know if they interact. I don't know if they speak. I don't know if they walk by like this. I don't know. I don't know. But something needs to be done. Offer them services. Maybe they're sick. Maybe they need an ambulance. Maybe they need to go to the hospital. Plain clothes, officers out of uniform. A lot of what works is crime prevention. Crime prevention is uh, a lot of outreach. The, the police are, I think it's about 35,000 now, but there's more eyes and ears if the public buys in as well, if they cooperate and they, they share information and they see something, they say something. Not just for terrorism, but as crime as well. Employees, the public, we give out constant crime prevention literature to get everybody in the game. Everybody has to participate. Police can't do it alone. Schools, if you have children and, and you want your children to get from home to school and school to home safely, it's a, it's a big, it's a priority to you as it should be. Over a million students use the subway every day and 15% of that crime is student related. So it is, it, is a, uh, it is a portion. Cameras. I understand the culture here is a little bit different than, than in New York City. Cameras are amazing technology. They work. They are successful. If you are outside walking in the street, you should have no expectation of privacy whatsoever outside in the street. In your home is different, in uh, the bathroom, in, the, in a changing room, but outside in the street, you should have no expectation of privacy whatsoever. You as, as citizens, you should demand more cameras. That's just my feeling. Because they will keep you safe, they will be a deterrent, they will prevent crime, 
And if you are the victim of a crime, the police, it's a tool that they can use quickly, effectively, to solve those crimes. Again, fighting crime is fighting terrorism. Technology is amazing. We have a lot of different, different tools that we use. If anybody's interested, we can speak afterwards. I don't want to... And I don't know if now is the time for questions or I'm going to... Afterwards. Okay. Thank you very much for your time and look forward to getting some questions from you. I have some questions. Yes, sir. Uh, when we in Sweden talk about zero tolerance in New York, uh, about the uh, development in New York, we always talk about zero tolerance. How important was that tool compared to other tools you had? The, the expression maybe some of you might have heard or not, we use the term broken windows. If you take care of the small things, the big things will take care of themselves. If there's some, the term you guys uh, use is hooligans on the corner and they're drinking beer. If nobody engages them, if the police do not interact with them, later on it turns into urinating. And then later on it turns into vandalism, breaking a car window. Maybe an assault, maybe a fight, maybe a robbery. If the police interacted when they were first drinking beer in public and stopped them, ask them for identification, possibly check their name, issue a summons, maybe if they're wanted for other crimes, maybe arrest. It's when you, the, the expression Jack Maple, he is the lieutenant that in, came up with the idea of Comstat, he said uh, uh, criminals do not take limousines to work. And their work is going to mit, commit a crime. They don't take a limousine to work. They start in the subway, they jump over the turnstile, go underneath. So if you take care of the small things, clean the graffiti right away, get rid of the homeless, not get rid of, but address them, it will give the feeling of someone is in control, someone is watching the store. The broken windows theory is if you have a house on your block and one window is broken, if you wait one week, two windows will be broken. Wait another week, three windows. Next thing you know, people will go inside to do drugs and they will squat there and they will live there and the homeless and the criminals will stay there. So next thing you know, you're the neighbor of that house and you say, I don't want to live here, I'm leaving. And you sell your house or you move from your apartment to another place and then it spreads like a disease. But if you take care of the window and fix the window, you're sending a message and telling people someone is in control, someone is watching the store. When you do a change like this, I mean, if you're a major and, and you succeed, then you get re-elected. But how do you motivate the, the single policeman on the street? That's an interesting question. The, the police commissioner at the time was William Bratton. And what he said was when he, first, when he first took over, he had all of his police commanders. He said, I want from you your resume, and I want from you your resignation, letter of resignation. I will decide which one I am going to accept. If you're in, you're in, and we're together. If you're not, go look for another employment. He set the tone, and he went out to roll calls, and he spoke to officers about to go on to patrol, and he said, if, you, if you're doing the right thing, if your heart is in the right place, I will support you till the end. I will back you up. But if you're doing something wrong, if you're committing corruption, abuse, abusing your position, uh, brutal police brutality, anything like that. He said, I will personally come and I will take your shield from you. I will put it in the newspaper and say that this number, this shield number, will never be issued again because it's been disgraced. So he, he went down uh, prior to Bill Bratton. The way that what they would do is they would tell everybody that the police commission is coming, the police commission is coming. So before he walked in the door, Someone would say to this group, nobody asks a question. <laughs> Anybody asks, asks a question, tomorrow you're out. Shut up. The police commissioner would come in and speak. Any questions? Any questions? Of course, no questions. Or maybe one easy one, little one. Okay, goodbye and leave. What, what Bratton did was he would come unannounced. He would ask all of the executives, can you please leave? Shut the door. Now, talking to the masses, talking to the men and the women, the boots on the ground, so to speak, and he would ask them and say, 
this is this is an opportunity to speak to the man. I am number one. What what? How can I help you do your job better? How can I empower you? So it, it again, it didn't happen overnight. It was difficult, but dealing with the unions and dealing with the uh, uh, they sometimes they say, is this the new flavor of the month? Yes or no? No. Well, I'm here to stay, and what my policies are here to stay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, arbetet i New York uh, var inte tvärtom vad vi ofta tror här i Sverige bara polisen eller polisens ansvar utan det var på många olika aktörer som agerade. Och en av de viktigaste var något som heter Project for Public uh, Spaces. Cynthia Nikitin har varit är vice vd för detta och ska berätta hur det här projektet bidrog till att uh, minska brottsligheten. Welcome Cynthia. Thank you. Can you hear me? Almost. Yes. Yes. Great. Okay. Great. Well, thank you all again for inviting me, and thanks to the Safer Sweden Sound Federation. Um, for bringing me here to this lovely island and this very interesting um, week-long conference that you're having that we don't have in our country. And I think it's a fantastic opportunity to actually meet your elected officials and talk to them. And I think we should start doing that, especially in a venue like this. Um, I work with Project for Public Spaces. We're a New York City-based uh, nonprofit urban planning and design firm. And um, the reason I was able to come was that I was already here uh, for a Future of Places conference. And this was a um, conference that happened in Stockholm last week, and it was co-sponsored by PPS, UN Habitat, and funded by the Axon Jonsson Foundation. Uh, we've been working with UN Habitat for about three years now. Um, they have become to understand that actually making public spaces better um, and more active actually can make cities safer. So the Global Network for Safer Cities um, is a sort of new organization coming out of UN Habitat, Global Network for Safer Cities, and UN Women are very focused on creating safer cities uh, for people in the, mostly in the global south and the developing world. So this issue of, of public space um, and how it supports cities is really growing um, beyond just North America. We've been around uh, for 35 years, um, but we work uh, to make systemic systemic changes. The design is there to reduce the risk factors for crime and increase the p protective factors within a space or within communities. Uh, this is an example. This is Campus Martius, which is a new central square in Detroit, Michigan. Detroit, Michigan has had three generations of racial strife, economic strife, riots, um, complete disinvestment in the urban core. Not a very safe city to be in. And the way that we worked with people in the city to bring it back was to create a central park, was to work with users and stakeholders and residents um, and business owners to change the dynamic, to create a program, activities, and uses um, that would attract and engage people. Uh, we were our William Holly White. William White was our founder. Um, and he basically said the best way to make a public space safe is not more police um, or not fences. It's to make it attractive to everyone else. When a public space is not well designed, not well used, not well programmed, um, uninteresting, no one wants to go there, the first thing you see are homeless people and the second thing you see are skateboarders. Because they want to be in a place where there's no one else. So these un loved space that have been abandoned because they haven't been designed or programmed to attract people. There's no reason for any of us to really go there. So that's kind of changing um, the dynamic. But it's really about um, empowering, engaging all the individuals in a community to participate and contribute to the creation of a shared space and a shared public realm that then defines them. So what is placemaking? Um, these are what we're learning. These are really universal principles, um, more than just something that's you know, New York or North American based. Um, it's an integrated planning process for creating safe neighborhoods, improving local trust, 
and cohesion, and reducing crime and fear of crime. Um, it really aims primarily at the physic, physical, economic, and social health of cities and neighborhoods, not necessarily um, the criminal aspects or, or other kinds of more specific things. It's really more of a physical, social. It's where design and planning and crime prevention come together. I'm sure you've heard of crime prevention through environmental design, SEPTED, which is very much about the design.